Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner uh, Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of, of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved comfort to me. Epaphras, who is, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends, send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. We'll do keep that open. And there's also a bit of an outline if, you, if that would be helpful for you, but let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, for, um, we thank you for the opportunity, the privilege it is to gather together as your people, and we pray that we would all have hope, open hearts to your message, to your spirit, to, so that he would have his way in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before Christmas, my wife Kirsty and I uh, got to experience something that we had never experience before and that is uh, we actually grew something uh, see just before uh, well a few months back we planted our first ever uh, veggie patch and much to our surprise it actually grew uh, so now we have uh, snow peas and tomatoes and basil and carrots uh, I know a few gardening types that's nothing to get excited about uh, but for us you know we feel like horticultural kings uh, we can grow things now, I mention that because we're uh, looking at this last chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians in the town of Colossae, but I just want us to get a sense of what all this letter is about, and it's about growing. Uh, we have this verse from the very beginning of the letter, it's there on the screen. It says, all over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. Now, this isn't uh, this is, uh, fruit you're going to see in a garden, is it? It's the fruit of people responding to the message of Jesus, that gospel, the good news, becoming Christian and growing as followers of him. Or there's these words also in chapter 1. It says, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's not a, a botanist, he's not a horticulturalist, he's not a farmer, but for him, this imagery of growth works. Uh, see, this is what God wants in people. And uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians obviously fits with MPC because you have your motto, growing followers of Jesus. Uh, that motto comes straight out of this letter. And it's there on the front page of your notice sheet, sheet every week, I notice. Uh, Eaton Sill Presbyterian Church, which uh, was planted by MPC, uh, five years ago, also kept that motto. So this letter fits perfectly uh, for Eaton Sill as well. But I think the danger any church faces, and I certainly think Eaton Sill faces it, is that we begin to think that whatever a letter like Colossians has to say, it's stuff that's relevant just for our church. Uh, this, is this stuff about growing followers of Jesus is for us, and really anyone outside of us, well, they can just get on and live their own life. Uh, for any Christian, I think there's a pull to very much make church, well, church that is just for us, and leave it at that. 
And the danger is church becomes comfortable and parochial and inward and clubby and clicky. All this stuff about growing as followers of Jesus is simply and only for the people who gather uh, with us. But the way Paul ends this letter, and I appreciate we're only looking at this end of the letter, but the way Paul ends this letter is he's, he's not letting us think that way at all. Uh, see, church, uh, your church is important. It's critical. It's where God does his work in people's lives. But growing followers of Jesus isn't just your business. It's everyone's business. And as we'll discover, God's not about making us feel comfortable and cosy in our little group. He wants us to turn from being inward to looking outward. Uh, we'll see in these words today that growing followers of Jesus happens as we look outside of ourselves to the world. And so on this, I just want to make three points. They're there in the outline, but they're uh, church that's a team, church that prays, church that acts wisely and talks graciously. So firstly, a church that's a team. And for this, for this, let's look at that last part of this letter, which in your Bible is probably given some uninspiring title like uh, Final Greetings. You know, it does sound like the leftover bits, doesn't it? You know, it makes me think of that ad, you know, no boring bits. Uh, for some ice cream, I think it was. Well, uh, this is not the boring bit. Uh, we'd miss out if we didn't have this bit. And here we got this sense of teamness. Uh, notice the different names that are given. Uh, Tychicus, Onesimus, Epaphras, Demas. Uh, for any pregnant women, take note. Some great name suggestions there. Um, and there's also Jesus, verse 11. Though it's not the Jesus, it's another one. But notice how Paul refers to them. Verse 7, Tychicus, my dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Or verse 9, Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Or verse 14, our dear friend Luke. Uh, what I want us to notice here is that Paul's not interested in playing the, you know, the apostle card. Uh, I'm the apostle, you're not. No, his mindset is we're fellow workers, fellow servants, wanting God to bring the growth. Uh, this passage is really totally devoid of any titles and positions within church. You know, denominations uh, have titles, don't they? Like archbishops and cardinals. There's the father, the padre, the venerable. Um, you know, Presbyterian denomination isn't free from that. There's the reverend. That's weird when you think about it, isn't it? The reverend. Now, Paul's not anti-leadership. Uh, we shouldn't be anti-leadership. But Paul thinks of others in terms of faithful ministers, fellow servants. You know, the thing about labelling people with titles is that titles are inevitably are about maintaining the structure. So you can't have titles without some sort of organisation to give those titles. And it's always a sort of top-down hierarchical triangle thing, isn't it? Uh, the titles need the organisation. The organisation thinks it needs the titles. But what if we're not a hierarchy? We're not a club with an organisational structure, but you're a team. Uh, faithful ministers, fellow servants, doing what we can together. You know, there's that well-worn phrase, there's no I in team. But I've discovered there's some comebacks for that. You could say, uh, well, there may be no I in team, but there is an M and an E. Um, but the point still stands. A team needs people working together to achieve something. And that's the way church should be. Not a, a structure to keep people in power, but working together so that the gospel would go forward. You know, we can think of team in terms of your church, and you can think of it in terms of, you know, kids' ministry or people taking on service roles here on a Sunday. You can think about it in, in, in different areas in, in the life of this church here. But there's another point about being a team in this passage, and it's the way that we can be a team for the gospel, even with people who are not here with you. Uh, see, check out verse 12, uh, back in chapter 4, verse 12. You've got Epaphras who can't be with his fellow Colossians. He's out of town, but he's praying for them. Or you've got verse 16. Uh, the Colossian Christians uh, should make sure they pass on this letter to the nearby town of Laodicea 
and they should do swapsy so that they read each other's letters that Paul's written to them. And it seems that when you read the letter, it seems that Paul's never even met the Colossians. But he's actually writing a letter to them, wanting to encourage them. My point here is that we can be a team, be fellow workers, even with Christians who aren't here. You know, I think of where Eaton's Hill came from five years ago out of MPC. And uh, you might have drawn the short straw today, but I'm really glad, is, uh, that, glad that Phil is out there this morning uh, preaching the word. You know, it's just a nice way of expressing that we have a connection with each other. We want the best for each other. And even this year, there's a plan afoot to do some sort of combined thing across MPC and Eaton's Hill and other churches on the north side, like Wavell Heights, where Jeremy is going. You know, we're working up a plan to do a combined Bible study series together. Um, do some sermons, uh, do a combined sort of sermon series together leading up to Easter, and you'll hear more about this, but it should be good. Or you can be, even be fellow workers with people who are even further away in other parts of the world. You know, I noticed uh, what you guys were doing here at MPC over uh, Christmas. It was very encouraging, raising money to educate kids in the uh, D Democratic Republic of Congo, helping David and Heather Kelly. And I see that you support a number of different um, missionaries working overseas. It's fantastic, fellow workers together, being a team so Jesus would be known and people would grow as followers of Jesus. So we're thinking about how church shouldn't exist for itself today. We should never have an inward view, uh, but an outward view. So here's the second thing. Be a church that prays so that people... Uh, so, that out, so that people outside of us would grow as followers of Jesus. Uh, for this, let's go back a little bit into chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, please turn to it. It says there, chapter 4, verse 2, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now it says, devote yourselves to prayer. Now I reckon I've hit on uh, one of the two issues that cause the most guilt for Christians. Uh, one of them is prayer, the other one is sharing your faith. And that's my next point anyway, so it's a double whammy today. Uh, but to, you know, this call to devote yourselves to prayer, it does seem full on, doesn't it? It really can produce guilt, can't it? Uh, let's be honest, how would you call yourself, how would you call your approach to prayer? Uh, would you say that you're devoted? But I take it there's no technique to becoming devoted to prayer. There's no method to becoming devoted to prayer. And certainly getting guilted into prayer is plain hopeless. No, I think the only way for us to grow and become more devoted to prayer is by having, what the rest, by having what the rest of the verse is about become true in us. And that is, have a look at verse 2 there. Uh, it says, being watchful and thankful. See, if Christian people would know Jesus better, know him better for who he is and what he's done for us on the cross, then we will become more truly thankful. If we would know Jesus better ourselves, if we would know more and more of his love and his grace, then we will grow in thankfulness. We'll be fill, filled with thankfulness. And then I take it, we might become more devoted to prayer. You know, I can't offer you any technique or method to pray more. I'd want you to just to know Jesus more. And I reckon out of thankfulness will come a desire to pray. And out of thankfulness for what Christ has done for us, our prayers will take us from looking inward to outward. That more people would come to know Jesus, Jesus that they know Jesus for themselves and grow as followers of him. As uh, Paul says in verse 3, we can then pray that doors would be opened to this gospel message. You know, Paul asked for prayer that doors might be opened for him to proclaim the message of Christ. And there's irony here, because when Paul's writing this letter, he's actually in prison. Uh, the doors are firmly shut to him, but he wants prayer so doors would be opened to his message. 
out of thankfulness for Jesus, being saved by grace. We can praise that, pray that doors would be open for the message. And as Paul says, verse 4, we can pray that the message would be spoken clearly. I, I just want to ask you, how much do you pray for open doors for the message of Jesus? How much do you pray for the message of Jesus to be spoken clearly? There are so many things we could pray for on this. Uh, we can pray for our friends, we can pray for our neighbours, we could pray for our work colleagues, uh, pray for your kids' biz leaders, pray for uh, the preaching on a Sunday, pray for those people working overseas that you're supporting, uh, pray for other churches like Eaton's Hill. Now, I think for the Christian person, the way we pray is probably the clearest diagnostic signal for knowing where our heart is at. Uh, is our focus on the inward, the clique, the club, or is our focus on the outward, that the gospel would go out and more people grow as followers of Jesus? You know, our prayers will show where our heart is at. Well, we're now on to our third and final point. Uh, we're thinking about how gospel growth, growing followers of Jesus, isn't just for us here, it's for the world. And so the third and final point is, uh, church that acts wisely and talks graciously. And this is from verse 5. It says there, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, of everything we're looking at today, it's here where it's most explicit that Christians, uh, church, should be outward focused. Because it talks about, verse 5, outsiders. Uh, there's a way to respond to outsiders. And, and I want to say on this, we don't have to be embarrassed about this term, outsiders. Because that's just the way it is. There are those people who are Christian, who've discovered God's grace, and there are those who haven't. Uh, outsiders. But here's a question for you. Uh, you can think of outsiders in an unhelpful inward way or in a helpful outward way. Uh, let me put it like this. Let me explain it like this. You know, when you think of certain people in your workplace or in your family or you hear the way media talks about Christianity, how do you respond to that? Uh, if people around you who are not Christian and don't act particularly Christian... What's your response like to them? In one of his books, pastor and author Timothy Keller puts it like this. He says, do you find yourself being a scoffer? Are you a scoffer? Scoffing at their foolishness? Scoffing at their sin? Scoffing that you're glad you're, you're not like them? Uh, be honest about what's going on in your heart. Uh, see, that's the inward way to respond to the outside. Uh, the outward way to respond to the outside is to realise you're no better, that you're a sinner saved by grace. And so in your heart, you're humble and you're compassionate and you're willing to reach out to them rather than turn your back to them. That's the outward way to respond to the outsider. And this passage goes on to say more about how to respond to outsiders, to uh, uh, in an outward way, it says, verse 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. You know, I used to think being wise here in this verse meant, you know, being smart, being savvy, developing skills and how to, you know, engage with the non-Christian world around us. But I've discovered, I, I don't think that's, that's what's going on here at all. Because in this letter, Paul's already spoken about being wise. And you can turn to it if you want. It's chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it says there, uh, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we may, and, that, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. See, I think we're being told here what it means to be wise. See, being wise is about having a relationship with Jesus and living it out. See, being wise is being real about Jesus and showing it in your life. Uh, being compassionate and kind and humble and patient 
That's being wise. Uh, being wise with the outsider doesn't mean you've got special smarts, you know, you're very cluey. It means just showing you're different. Uh, showing that Jesus really has made a difference. That's being wise to the outsider. Uh, the other thing here about being uh, outward to the outsider is in how we walk, but also in how we talk. Because uh, it says, verse 6, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, full of grace doesn't mean speak graciously like speak politely, though I'm sure that's important. But full of grace means speak in a way that points to the grace of God in your life. It'll mean not scoffing, not looking down on others. It'll mean as the opportunity comes, speaking of the grace of God and what Christ has done, making it clear that you're not better than anyone else. It's just that you've discovered that God's full of grace. Uh, where it says be seasoned with salt, it's hard to know what that means. But perhaps it means you know, engaging, sort of you know, speaking in a flavoursome way. It's, it's a little bit hard to tell. But I think this whole issue of speaking of the Christian faith to the outside is a difficult one. It brings guilt, doesn't it? It's like prayer. We think, I don't pray enough. I don't share my faith enough. Now, we can all get very guilty about this. But I just want to be clear, when it comes to speaking of the grace of God... I don't think this is forcing our views on anyone. It's not barging in. It's not Bible bashing. It's about taking opportunities when they come. Uh, and we'll fail to take opportunities when they come, for sure. But with a heart for the outsider, uh, we'll want to be outward and not give up and seek to give an answer when people ask. Uh, our street had their Christmas party a few weeks ago and uh, there I was having a drink with our neighbours in our carport and I was uh, chatting to one of the guys about Christianity. This sort of conversation doesn't come up all the time, I tell you, but it did, did that day. And I can't even remember how we got into a conversation, but my, na my neighbour was chatting about his, how he's an atheist. He's pretty, he was pretty forcefully telling me how it's all just a bunch of rubbish. And at one point he said, uh, the Christian faith is a crutch for people to lean on to get through life. And I, I thought about it for a second, and then I agreed, and I said, yeah, I think the Christian faith is a crutch to lean on. And I said, but doesn't every person have a crutch to lean on to get through life, whether it be family or the, their work or their beautiful house? And after thinking about it for a couple of seconds, he actually agreed with me. Uh, what I wanted to get around to was to point out that it's not so much about the crutch, but whether that crutch is valid. I actually wanted to get on to talking about the historical record of Jesus. We didn't even get to that point, I've got to say. The conversation moved on in another direction, but I guess it was a start. See, we can pray that in our friendships, our relationships, uh, we'd act wisely, speak of grace, be outward, and know how to answer each person. You know, Colossians is a letter that has stacks full of truth about Jesus, his identity, what he came to do for us, uh, what is the true Christian faith. But it's not truth for church, as if church is a club. This is something for the world. We should see ourselves in a team, even a far-reaching team, uh, working for more people to come to know Jesus. Uh, out of thankfulness for what Christ has done, we can pray for more people to come to know Jesus, and we can act wisely in our relationships with others that full of grace, uh, we would act in a way and speak in a way that's full of grace so they might hear of the message of God's grace, that Jesus came into the world for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we... Thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that he came and lived, he taught, he did amazing things and he willfully gave his life for us. That he took on our sin on the cross so that we could be brought into relationship with you, so that we could be forgiven. Father, we take that so easily for granted. We admit that. But we pray that we would grow and become more and more full of thankfulness for what Christ has done. Bringing us into relationship with you is an awesome thing. 
And so, Father, out of that knowledge, uh, Father, may we have a desire and a love uh, for others. We, we would desire that they would grow as followers of Jesus. Father, may, we, may you work in our lives. As we know Jesus better and better, uh, may we grow to be prayerful people. And Father, we pray that we would uh, grow to be more and more focused on the outsider, that we could do all that we can so that they might come to know your grace and your love in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.